welcome to a special bonus episode of Character Creation Spotlight, everyone. In this bonus segment, we will be shining a light on some current or up-and-coming games to keep an eye out for. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia, and today we are welcoming Jay Dragon and Lily J. Harris to talk about... See, now I should have asked about this before. How do you say this? Either way, any, any way is fine. You can okay. say it any way and all are correct. Oh, <laughs> well, I already like this game. <laughs> uh, today we are welcoming Jay Dragon and Lily J. Harris to talk about Yazeba's Bed and Breakfast, a slice of life tabletop role playing game set at a beautiful bed and breakfast deep in the woods where mischief and magic govern. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Character Creation Spotlight, both of you. Uh, it's really great to have you here with us. Thanks. Thank That's you. cool to be here. Uh, Jay, could you start us off by telling a, a little bit about yourself and what sort of projects you have going on right now? Uh, hi, I'm Jay Dragon. Uh, I don't use pronouns. Uh, I am the editorial director of Possum Creek Games, uh, and I am also one of the writers on board Yuseva's Bed and Breakfast. You might know me from Sleepaway, a queer horror tabletop role-playing game about campers or wander home pastoral slice of life fantasy traveling game. My turn. <laughs> yes, Lily, please tell us about you. So my name is Lily J. Harris. I'm a cartoonist and illustrator and a writer from Southern Maryland. And I'm a writer for Yezebas Bed and Breakfast or Yezebas or however iteration you, you imagine. Zebes. <laughs> You're a writer for the Zebes. <laughs> so I guess I want to start by asking about that real quick. It's like, why leave it open? I mean, I know that. You know, obviously, you're not coming into people's houses to tell them how to pronounce anything at all, ever. Um, but was there, like, why you choose to just say, do what you want? I think, I mean, Jay, I'm going to let you go, but I think that's already kind of the the ethos of Yuseva's anyway, mm -hmm. you know, of just, like, mm -hmm. not really having a lot of parameters as to how people play with it or interact with it, really. Yeah. Very and, nice. like, very much, it's a it's a game about, in a lot of ways, it's a game very inspired by... Uh, other forms of role playing, such as fan fiction and like mm. fan relationships. Um, and one of the things we want to make was that f let everyone feel like they kind of own the game the moment. Like it's like their game, their copy, their world when they kind of mm. when they go into it. And part of that is allowing like it's a tactic to have little choices at the start of the game that kind of yeah. give people the emotional freedom to be like, well, if I can choose how Yuziba's name is pronounced, I can also make these bigger choices later on, you know? I like that. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that we we talk about a lot, um, in our case, particularly in the lens of character creation, of like, how do the things that you're doing at that very beginning, the first time that you touch this game, impact what you do the rest of the time and how does it sort of tell you what it's going to be like and kind of, you know, set those mm -hmm. stepping mm -hmm. stones for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to see how just like little choices. I'm always I'm always fascinated when people have like little decisions <laughs> like that. And you think of all of those minute details that go into it, mm -hmm. and, like stuff that I just never would have <laughs> thought of. <laughs> it's like, oh, you are so much smarter than me. <laughs> game, design, uh -huh. game design is oftentimes thinking too much about the details. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, but I love it like the things that come out of those little decisions that people make and the way that it has such a big impact and like snowballs as you go just is it's so fascinating and thrilling to me absolutely i love that part of game design mm. <laughs> absolutely uh well thank you both for being here um now since this is an abridged version of our normal format i uh, will be sticking to the highlights of the system with a special focus on character creation, or in this case, lack thereof. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we'll get into that uh, without further ado. Uh, how about we find out what this game is all about? What's in a game? So we started talking a little bit about this uh, before we got here. Uh, can you tell us the, the, the core concept of yeah, Zebas, uh, Ben and Breakfast? <laughs> uh, oh. Lily, do you want to get the narrative and I'll get the mechanics? Sure, 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 sure. Okay, so um, off the top of the head, spitballing here, the narrative <laughs> of Yezebiz, Yezebiz, Zebes, Bed and Breakfast, um, generally speaking, it is a heartless witch who inevitably ended up selling her heart to have this magical bed and breakfast that houses all of these various creatures uh, and people in it. Um, and so at least the narrative aspect of it, it, it gives people the chance to kind of get into already pre-established characters 
um, and a whole host of different guests within that that story as well. And the way you play each game is you you get together, you pick a chapter, which is like about an hour long episodic event. Like maybe mm. it's going fishing, maybe it's you know, uh, maybe it's like fighting a weird scarecrow monster in the woods at night. Maybe it's like mushroom picking, right? Like you pick an, an activity mm. um, from the chapter. You pick uh, from the guests and the residents that are currently unlocked, like the kind of characters who are around. And then you play for about an hour. You play as those characters. You make decisions uh, with stickers and like you make you make marks on the character sheet that will impact when people pick that sheet up again in the future. And then if you mm. want, you can play another chapter. You can play different characters if you want. You can swap it around. Uh, over time, you can unlock more guests, more chapters, kind of explore deeper into the book. Uh, but that's kind of the core structure of it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Oh, cool. So can you tell us a little bit more about the setting for this? So obviously it's a world with magic and that kind of thing. Is there mm -hmm. a lot of like detail to it or is it left pretty open? It's It's set in a kind of like pastiche 20th century um we, <clears throat> we have a lot of like kind of like, like a 20th century full of like weird magical things um yeah it's like yeah. never really an established <laughs> time period yeah. i know specifically it's like there is no internet that's like mm -hmm. the most yeah. we give it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the so setting it itself could it, be mm -hmm. could be like modern day even uh but there's just mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing big technology wise. Even yeah, we, we, we've talked about how like it could be anywhere from like easily 1950s to like 2010s, but everyone's too poor for cell phones. Kind mm -hmm. of like yeah. like there's no Wi-Fi out in the woods kind of thing. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and the, it's, a, it's a place mm -hmm. to get away from the technology. Exactly. And the idea of the setting is this it's this it's this magical bed and breakfast full of life. And there are these, um, you know, the characters range from like a girl who ran away from home and is sleeping in the dryer in the laundry room to like <laughs> the the child the spawn of satan who is left on the front door and has been raised as just like a a, 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 a hyperactive kid mm -hmm. um and so there's like all these different kind of kind of characters uh that what we tried to do a lot of was hinting at the setting and like pointing in directions but never kind of mm -hmm. letting people fill in a lot for themselves mm -hmm. yeah have you done a lot of like a lot of playtesting with it? I would be super interested to sort of see like based on people's lived experiences, like what kinds mm -hmm. of things they infer from mm -hmm. those small details. That would be super fascinating to me to watch, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. be like, oh, I put this detail in there thinking that you would get this out of it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you went over here. <laughs> well, Lily, if you want to talk a little bit about Rock mm -hmm. On, which I, is a chapter you wrote that I feel like has a lot of those kind of inferences and moments of that. Yeah. So just so I'm clear. Uh, question mark worm stonk yeah worm stonk okay cool <laughs> i want to make sure on the same page mm -hmm. um yeah so at least for me writing this chapter this chapter um involves two people who are going to one of their first like local hardcore shows um mm -hmm. and so for me personally being from that scene in my youth just like okay like i'm taking my own experience of going to house shows and the different like archetypes of people you would find that would go to a house show um, yeah. And then having one character super experienced with that kind of culture and then the other mm -hmm. who's like, this is their baptism by fire. Mm -hmm. um, that was really great. But mm -hmm. honestly, on the vein of actual plays and seeing people interpret characters in ways that I was not expecting. Um, Jay, I cannot remember off the top of my head, but you will probably remember the latest actual play that's happening uh, based on episodes. So like on the podcast. Oh, the the podcast one with with yeah. all the folks. Yeah, that's the yeah that's the the you say it was Ben Breakfast podcast with Jeff Stormer. Yeah, mm. Mm -hmm. Oh. the the person and I want to get their name correctly, but the person who was playing Parish has <laughs> oh Brennan Parish, Brennan. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. um, Brennan Lee Mulligan. Yeah. So in the in the characterization, I have a Parish. Parish is a chef for the bread and breakfast who was also a frog who was turned into a frog um but was in a previous life a knight and so the characterization of this parish in this actual play really leans heavy into like knighthood mm -hmm. <laughs> in like a really playful way of just like mm. talking with such um i don't know just like such esteem and mm -hmm. it's really really campy and really fun um mm -hmm. and that's something <laughs> i wouldn't have gone with initially but it mm -hmm. totally works yeah. Oh, it's amazing. 
That's actually that podcast we've been doing with Jeff Stormer is a great example of that because Parrish is in every single episode and in each episode played by someone totally different. So oh, cool. in one episode, oh, right, you've got nice. this very Arthurian, like Brennan, Brennan takes Parrish and is like, by Jove, we must, yes. you know, like defeat the kitchen. <laughs> uh, but then like someone else, someone else will take Parrish. I've heard from uh, Canadian players that, uh, or like uh, Canadian players that they will, that people will oftentimes make Parrish French when they're mm. playing in, in, in mm. Canada because of the Quebec, Quebecois. And they'll kind of make Parrish kind of this French night, which is very different than like a, an American association. But then also people will play him as just like a cool dad or like a funny dad or like, mm -hmm. uh, like there's like, like because of that. That is there's, so cool. Mm -hmm, because there's this like one kind of like, there's like kind of an understanding of Parrish as this, you know, like almost like Comedia dell'arte, right? Where it's like Parrish mm -hmm. is this character, but we've intentionally left really big gaps where mm -hmm. yeah. everyone brings their own things to the table, which means that mm -hmm. kind of the characters become, like, the whole world becomes your own, right? Like, with the Rock right. On chapter, it's like, is this, like, is, you know, like, like I think you could probably even, you know, run that chapter as anywhere from a frat party to a hardcore show to, like, a hippie mm -hmm. venue. I was talking yeah. to some folks recently who were asking if Rock On had alcohol in it because they weren't, they were trying to figure out whether or not their show was family friendly. They weren't sure where not to put it. And the chapter is ambiguous, intentionally mm -hmm. so, so that you can kind of f manipulate the narrative to be what is kind of at your comfort level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really love this. I really, I, I mean, just this, this sort of like, um, you know, like personal lived experience concept is a thing that, I've been paying more attention to because my son is learning about it in like mm -hmm. his literature classes and stuff right now and like pointing out he's really big into pointing out all the facts that like um, every time someone like in a show doesn't look like him that's his thing right now is mm -hmm. like that person doesn't look like me but I still like this show mm -hmm. um, and I just I find it so fascinating to be able to like we put so much of ourselves into role playing games mm -hmm. and sort of like you've left this like almost like jar shape where it's like I can put whatever I want in the jar, but like mm -hmm. it's going to be roughly this shape mm -hmm. and just to see like what people put in there. One mm -hmm. of like, mm -hmm. it's so cool. <laughs> One of the things we've talked about a lot in terms of like meta meta concepts around the game is this idea of like communal fan fiction or the idea that like mm -hmm. the game itself is fan fiction for a TV show and a book series that doesn't exist. And yeah. so the choices you're making about your character are very fanfic or fan... Like, I mentioned fandom earlier, right? Like, that kind of fan fiction right. relationship with... Like, this is your head... Like, I will oftentimes... Uh, people will make fun of me sometimes because when I talk about Yusebas, I will, like, talk about my head cannons for characters. Yeah. Because it's important to me to distinguish that, like, this is how I imagine Parrish, but there's nowhere in the text that says that. So it's yes. just my head cannon, And it's there's no truth to... There's no objective truth, Right. It's just my theory. I think that's a thing that we don't talk about enough in RPGs. Like, we were mm -hmm. going to, at one point, do an episode on that, Ryan, I think, like, for our uh, character evolution cast about, mm -hmm. like, using RPGs as your fanfic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, to sort of, like, fix your problematic canons and mm -hmm. to, you know, like, insert mm -hmm. the characters that you wish would have been there. And I, mm -hmm. I wish that we talked more about that because it is a really big part of the game for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And and I love that in this case, even the designer of the game gets to have a uh, headcanon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think well, we actually made a, there were a lot of intentional things with Lily. Actually, do you want to talk about your your relationship with RPGs prior to coming out of this project? Yes. Yeah, it's going to be a very short explanation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my relationship with TTRPGs was I once sat in on a friend's D&D session a couple years ago and thought, oh, wow, this is real stupid. Real stern. <laughs> um, no, like my role play experiences come from like prose one on one role play experience, which is like long paragraph fiction writing um, yeah. with like a collaborative writing partner, but really never anything in terms of an actual tabletop uh, reference mm -hmm. at all. So, mm. which was really refreshing, apparently, which was nice, but it, it was a bit of a learning curve. I'm like, all right, so what exactly are tokens? <laughs> and things of that nature. Was this um, mechanic? Yeah. Yeah, but honestly, it, learning so much about it so quickly has been really helpful. But also, like Jay has said, thankfully, bringing in a perspective that is not completely yeah. drenched in TTRPG um, yeah. for a game that isn't really. Well, I won't say it's not. <laughs> it's not that it definitely is. 
Yeah, but mm-hmm. when you want to work outside of like what that sort of like structured box is, mm-hmm. you know, like we don't have character creation and, you know, we both came into this like, mm-hmm. okay, tell us about your character creation. And you're like, there isn't one. <laughs> you're like, well, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, there are things that you assume going into mm-hmm. it. There are things mm-hmm. that we just are like, that's what a game is. And mm-hmm. it's always nice to have somebody say, mm, but it does it have to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because our understanding of like, I, I think about a lot how what we use to shape the canon of what counts as a role playing game is through mm-hmm. a very specific lens. Right? And we talk about the history of role playing games in, again, like kind of a meta way. Uh, we talk about the history of war games and the history of Dungeons and Dragons. But that is one avenue of role playing. And there are many other avenues of role playing, like, you know, one on one text role play. Um, I used to mm-hmm. do like Homestuck style chat log role play when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. Um, there's ask blogs on Tumblr. There's kids in the playground role playing warrior cats. These things <laughs> yes. that we associate yeah. with these things that, you know, we, we view as childish or cringy. And like, in a sense, yes, they are, you know, ways of playing for kids, <laughs> but also... Right. They're a huge But that's avenue. where play starts. Exactly. Like, that's where we all start mm-hmm. with that is, you know, like I look at, you know, I have kids. It's like they're small. You're like watching them and you're like, you, yeah. you're playing pretend. And I just came in and gave you rules. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm like, exactly. now it's a game. <laughs> like, yeah. this yeah. makes it okay because now you have dice. Mm-hmm. Like, no. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> and, and that's a lot of that's a lot of our philosophy is that like if we're like we're, we want to create games that are uh, much more holistic and understanding what we can learn from. Right. Like when you. There's a great quote by Hayao Miyazaki that's been going on Twitter a lot lately about how the problem in Hayao, in Miyazaki's viewpoint, the problem with modern anime is that it, it is self-referential, that it's being made by people mm-hmm. who only consume anime. And I can't yeah. speak to what's going on in anime in Japan in 2022, but I can speak to that. I think that one of the major challenges with role playing games in in the modern day is that they are very self-referential and that they are only a lot of them are only communicating mm. with role-playing games historically or shallow pastiches of other forms of media. And so a big mm. part of the challenge is how do we actually learn from right like if we imagine Warrior Cats is a role-playing game, what do we learn from it? If we imagine the Chronicles of Narnia are a role-playing game, what do we learn from it? Right? These kind of change yeah. relationships. Yeah. Well, and I think that just gives you a whole new freedom to to do things differently, to say, you know, like, it's fine if we don't use dice. Mm -hmm. It's fine if we, you know, don't use playbooks or Mm -hmm. we don't make characters or it Mm -hmm. gives you permission to sort of just try something completely new and different in a way that I think a lot of designers feel really bound by, like, these are the structures that make it okay, that Mm -hmm. make it a game. Um, So I'm really excited to see something that just kind of falls outside of that. It's just, it's Mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And and I'm seeing a big trend of like storytelling focused games where you're not actually playing scenes for the most part. You're, you're constructing the story Mm -hmm. as if you're kind of uh, doing a synopsis of what kind of happened and what the conversations kind of contain, but not actually having the Mm -hmm. conversations as characters, uh, which is really interesting. And the, the more narrative focused as well. Mm -hmm. uh it's it's a really interesting trend yeah yeah i mean we've definitely seen a rise in like journaling games over the last couple Mm -hmm. years too Mm -hmm. which sort of speaks to some of that like you know um collaborative writing process so we you know like i'm looking at one that i really want to play with one of my friends right now that is just like a back and forth journaling game and Mm -hmm. it's like that's still role playing Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. you know we're I, I think we're expanding mm-hmm. some of that now, finally. I'm, I'm just one of the writers on Yazeba's Burn Breakfast, but a very important part for me in terms of game design was, in. I think when I wrote my first game and I put it online, the first bit of feedback I got was from a Reddit post that said, this is not a game. Um, <laughs> and the spite that that gave me has been like the spark that's fueled the past it's four years. Powerful of creative... motivator. Yeah, just, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't a game? Oh, let me, okay, if that, like, the, re- the revelation that no matter what I do from a very early point, that no matter what I create, people won't call it a game. So mm-hmm. why not just push what a game can be to want. its limits, right? Because I'm, I'm already, I'm, there's no like, one no I'm trying to win over. what Reddit will say you're wrong. Exactly. So why <laughs> exactly. bother trying to please them? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Reddit. You do you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. I, I don't know. I think I've... Over the last couple of years, like, you know, like reading stuff for the Ennies, especially like just the number of things that we've gotten that it's like a couple of years ago, I don't know that I would have 
called this a game, but it totally is. Like, mm-hmm. it just it's it's incredible. I mm-hmm. love seeing the way that this this hobby and industry is growing and like yep. expanding. It's very cool. Yeah, we should get back are, to talking about this game in particular. I, though, probably. I agree. I, I've mm-hmm. been thoroughly enjoying this conversation. Not just, like, how is my mind blown? <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, we we talked a little bit about the. I heard there was tokens possibly in this game. So what oh. what sort of materials do we need? I was say, don't to quote play? me on that. Don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the word that tokens. Is a, that is a I heard tokens. That was a tokens mean materials. Uh, no, no, you were correct. You were correct. Don't worry. You nailed it. Um, Lily is heavily involved in the narrative process, which mm-hmm. is a very a very different piece from the silly mechanical parts. But the way the game works mechanically is each chapter has its own rules. So the rules of the game oh, cool. change almost completely based on which chapter you're mm. playing. There are some common things. There are some common like game objects which chapters will use in different ways, such as a deck of playing cards, coins, uh, tokens, index cards. Um, okay. If you don't have the the chapters indicate which ones need which. So if you don't have the right things, you can just choose a different chapter. Um, mm. So it's very like it's very like you know kind of adaptable on the fly like that, and also like. You know, you can always cheat. That's fine, too. Um, <laughs> uh, there are some surprise chapters that have some secret other things. I think my personal favorite mm-hmm. is uh, among the little surprises is the tale of Sir Parrish the Bold, which mm-hmm. uses a D20 um, and has stat blocks um, and is the only instance <laughs> of dice. And it's just my little joke to... Um, yeah, it's just it's just a little joke. So like about, now it's a game. Yeah, it's like now it's a game, right? Like <laughs> there's a chapter where you're where you're where you're fighting dragons as a knight. Happy Isn't that enough? Reddit. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> like there's our little there's our little moment. But overwhelmingly, yeah, the game. And what's cool, right, about specific characters in these chapters is that you can tailor the mechanics to the characters. So yeah. um, I was playtesting a chapter a few weeks ago that's about um, doing laundry, um, and. One of the characters uh, has a special track that monitors how grossed out by the laundry they are. Um, And it's like their personal game mechanic, their own little like section of the game with its own rules. That's for whoever is playing that specific character. Or like there's a couple of chapters that have like edge cases. Like there's like one chapter whose entire thing. This is very odd. This chapter, like the chapters get weirder as you go further into the book. (laughs) Um, <laughs> there's one chapter, uh, where there's a machine that clones people. Um, uh, I'm like, oh. and Hey Kid, the demon child has climbed in it and there's eight Hey Kids running around. Um, oh, no. <laughs> but there's rules at the end for edge cases of what happens if this specific thing or combination of things ends up in the cloning machine. Like just to kind of mm. cover some some gaps, uh, which is and like has like there's some special ways to like unlock a special guest or like you know do cheese a special thing if you if you use the edge cases, which is like just like such a oddly specific thing that you can just put in the corner of a book and have be like mm. interesting and narratively relevant. Um, Absolutely. Oh, that's so fun! I love <laughs> I love that they're just like all different things. I don't know. It's just very much like something for everyone which lots of games say and i think in lots of cases they do but this is like a very different version of that Mm -hmm. that's just oh i'm like really excited about this (laughs) i'm I'm always fascinated by uh by slice of life rpgs uh because it's it's like um i i've seen quite a few of them over the years and they they they're always super interesting in how mundane some of the stuff is but like mm-hmm. you, you add those little bit twists here and there, and it takes that mundane to like a whole new level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just so fascinating to play in that sort of space. Yeah, it's always interesting too how how different they all are from each other. Mm-hmm. Like, what parts of mundane are you trying to capture? Mm-hmm. Um, what everybody's idea of that is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um. So this game doesn't have character creation, um, despite the fact that you are on character creation cast. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about what led to that decision? Why why you chose to make a game that went that way? And then um, maybe tell people a little bit about what kinds of characters they can play when they sit down to play this game. Lily and I, before this call, were talking about all our favorite guests. So um... I, I am so I'm like 
biting my i'm just like i want to talk about these guys I, right I'll, I, I will quickly <laughs> explain why we chose to do prefab characters and then lily yeah. please take us down a magical journey tell of, us all your okay, favorite like, things oh, so <laughs> uh, really quick the reason why we chose to do um pre-constructed characters is because um i'm uh me and the other designer, M, M is the co-creator who did a ton of the mechanics, M Vesluck at Nightling Bug on Twitter. Um, and she um, has, like, we were both really interested in specificity and the idea of mm. being able to tell um, much more powerful stories by having, like, the mechanics really be very specific. Um, and so we somewhat early on were like, what if each character is effectively a self-contained game mechanic system? And mm. we ended up kind of going a lot from there, but that was kind of a lot of the core. And we were, we were you know, a little ins inspired by Lady Blackbird, which is another game that does that, but I think to a more limited degree. Um, and mm. then we were like, oh, well, what if you, well, obviously, if you've got this bed and breakfast, you have to have all these like eccentric guests staying there. And then, you know, we, uh, we wrote 50 of them. <laughs> 50 seven residents and then 50 guests yeah <laughs> wow that's amazing just, just Lily, Lily, tell us about a few of them <laughs> please yes please, Here I come. please. You, you've You're tagged ready. me in from the ring <laughs> I, was, I was drinking gatorade and <laughs> <What's that? laughs> ragged bones with a steel chair <laughs> that's, that's really it Ooh, vera mm. did i coming in with the illegal move okay yeah. so mm -hmm. like jay said we have seven <laughs> residents already but the 50 guests are what other players can choose from to play with themselves or mm -hmm. as with themselves residents um, are effectively like the main characters like they're mm. they're the ones who are most frequently going to be chosen from and guests kind of serve as this like if you need an extra character, if none of the residents appeal to you, if you want to do something special, here's all these guests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is really lovely. Like, I, I believe, like, some of them, even though they're our guests, are known to just, like, stick around semi-indefinitely in the bread and breakfast. Like, some of them are known to, like, oh, they're just passing through. But there are some that are pretty much standard already there. Um mm -hmm. And what's really lovely about the guests um, is that there is a short description, like a one line description as to what this guest is all first blush. And then mm -hmm. you have bingos and whoopsies. <laughs> bingos <laughs> being effectively like, what are their, you, you don't want to make it like a binary positive negative, but just what mm -hmm. are like their strong suits? Like what is something that they're really efficient mm -hmm. at or uh, a good trait for them, I guess. And whoopsies are just, where do they fall short <laughs> as like mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and creatures? Um, and it's really wonderful. I have a couple in quotation marks, I say, as I pull out a giant pad. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I will spare you and just pick like maybe like one or two that I really like. Um, there is, of course, I'm going to go with Bud Woodruff. Bud Jay. Woodruff is mm. so great. I, I love, love Bud. Bud. I love Bud so much. <laughs> <laughs> so bud is a a literal flower <laughs> um jay i want you to like help me describe bud because i say it's a yeah. flower he's like he's like a he's a flower he's he's a trans do you know what an alron is um no. it's a weird it's a flower monster from french folklore and he's okay. a trans he's a trans man he's a transmasculine flower monster that loves to play basketball and goes to high school oh, wow. oh yeah it makes sense mm -hmm. and i feel like for me at least <laughs> that bud, old trope yeah, for me though bud is like such an easily accessible like jockey character without being mm -hmm. off-putting like mm -hmm. yeah very earnest and i think that's what i really like about bud it's like oh no you, you're earnestly mm -hmm. just vibing like you're really mm -hmm. just out here <laughs> um i don't know there are certain characters that i feel like uh, at least for me in terms of guest list, I'm like, oh, this is something I would naturally gravitate to. And I would not naturally gravitate towards a bud. And the I think the great thing about having such an extensive list is you can fall into like your natural pattern of character play, but you can also go mm -hmm. completely left field and try out someone totally new. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many I love. And, and I because love. you switch characters like every hour, basically, mm -hmm. you can find like I felt there's one play test. Structure. I've been doing in real life play tests with this big binder full of papers and glue and stickers. But um, mm -hmm. there's one player, there's one player who just wants to play Parish. Every time he shows mm -hmm. up, he plays the frog. That's his character. He's invested. Other people show up and they're like, let me look through the pile of guests. Let me see if I can find someone who's maybe different than who I normally play. And because mm. you change it effectively every hour, it lets you 
take experimental risks, right? You can try yeah, out. Yeah, you don't have to commit to mm-hmm. something, which is, I know, like, in a campaign is something that I, like, get really stressed about. I'm like, this character has to be perfect because I'm going to, like, I, we got to see, like, the growth arc and we've got to do, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, like, I'm less like that on our show because I never have to play any of them at all. <laughs> um, but I like the idea of being able to kind of switch and be like, you know, I'm going to get a feel for this. And if it's mm-hmm. not for me, I can do mm-hmm. something else next time or. And, and also you know? based on your emotional state, like what I really love about these guest lists are that there are several characters that are intentionally nonverbal. Uh, so mm-hmm. depending on if you show up and you want to be there with your friends and, and play these Ava's, um, you can still play and just not speak like a uh, little. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, like little Crookneck is. Crookneck the pumpkin boy. I love Crookneck. <laughs> like, Crookneck the pumpkin boy communicates by bouncing, just bouncing oh. on a little mm-hmm. stick um, and does not speak. And also uh, there's a a stone guest, like a literal ancient floating stone that uses it its mm. pronouns and just does not talk, just communicates by floating and making uncomfortable <laughs> bass boosted sounds. It's possibly just a rock. It is potentially <laughs> just a rock. It's really it's it's, it's, it's Rocco from Sesame Street. <laughs> its name its name is also really hard to pronounce. It's the yeah. the t- the Tisseleth, I think is mm. how you're supposed to say it. But and, mm. yeah, it's this like bizarre old rock. My, one of my favorite uh, guests on a mechanics level is um, Rag and Bones, who is yes. one of the first guests you start with. Who is this really like nefarious skeleton who's just trying to mm. constantly plot to ruin the Ben Blair breakfast? Um, he has a really <laughs> long journey, so he's trying to get like thirty points. Like he's trying, he's trying to like he's trying to basically like it's a very long and arduous process to get him to complete his journey. And once he does so. Uh, you have to, like, go to the part of the book that tells you the rules for when the world ends and, like, the world starts to end and, like, Mm. you have to, like, like, that changes the whole tenor of the game for the next several sessions until you can, Mm. like, save the world. It's, like, a whole side plot that's hidden in the back of the book. (laughs) Uh, And Rag and Bones, at any moment, anyone can tell him to restart from the beginning. So at any moment, anyone can foil his plans and restart. So it's the Sisyphean endeavor of him trying to bring about the end of the world. And there are rules... For if you let him succeed, if the whole group is like, let's let Rag and Bones have this one, there's game mechanics for what to do when the world is ending. <laughs> but you don't you don't ever like you could always be like, no, none of that. Don't do that, Rag and Bones. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop it, Rag and Bones. Oh, that's I just have to say, like, the idea of having characters that are like I won't I don't want to say less involved, but sort of like mm-hmm. less at the forefront mm-hmm. too, um, is like making me tear up a little um. bit. Um, because I am somebody who gets like, have a lot, you know, look, I've got lots of mental health issues. Um, and one of those things is a lot of times I will go to have game night and I am just too overstimulated. Like I've had too long of a day. Like a lot of times my gaming group would meet on Sunday nights. We would have recorded this for like five or six hours. And I'm like, I just can't do people, Mm -hmm. but I miss my friends and so it's like, well, I have to cancel a game night because I just don't have it in me to be like charismatic and interesting and fun. Mm. But that means I don't get to hang out with my friends. Mm. And so like the idea of like having a character there that's like I can participate without having to be like this like bright ray of sunshine mm-hmm. is like yeah. really nice. It's really <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to try not to cry um, because I have lots of days like that where I just like I don't have anything left. Mm-hmm. But like I mm-hmm. still want to do things like I don't want to have to say no to participating in something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, I really appreciate having those yeah. options there for people. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that makes a big difference for someone like me. <laughs> um, I think that I, I have spent a lot of time looking at games and watching how people play. I think that my biggest gripe with games right now as a whole is that a lot of games presume constant active involvement from everyone and I think ignore mm. the realities of what it's like to play which is that you know like when i've when i run games for people sometimes there's someone who just has to like lie down the whole time and occasionally like yell out a thing from the bed right sometimes yeah. i'll play games and there's someone who's nervous because they've never played a game before and they want to be drawing in their sketchbook sometimes there are people who are who, who are ready to be the center of attention and like are able to give that that energy um and i think that it's important for like as a game designer part of the like a game designer is like effectively you are giving people tools to build spaces for play. And Mm. an important part of that is that the, like you need to make room for all kinds of play, not necessarily just 
the most like the most present best selves of the players right because like yeah you don't mm-hmm. want to design for bad faith but that's not bad faith that's just that there are many people who need mm-hmm. need to take a break during play right like that games yeah, like are, sometimes yeah. i am an adult and i am not mm-hmm. my peak drama club self like yeah, exactly some days yeah. you know we are, we like are I human beings kid and mm-hmm. i'm tired yeah. <laughs> like, and, and games games should i think design with the assumption that the players are you know players have all different levels of things to bring to the table yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and it's very cool that uh, w- w- there's a lot of talk about um you know sharing the spotlight uh, nowadays and and how it's you know good table etiquette to to try to shine the light on on other folks playing their mm-hmm. characters at the table and then they'll do the same to you and, and et cetera et cetera and if somebody wants to be a background character uh it, it sounds like we can still shine the spotlight on them mm-hmm. being a background mm-hmm. character yeah they right. don't they yeah. don't have to be at the forefront they mm-hmm. don't have to be the primary hero or anything like my that. Yeah. one of my big things that i feel very strongly is that there's always more ways to play than the game designer can imagine and like it is the goal of the game designer to make space for not only all the different ways of play the game designer can imagine but also all the other ways too that, right. that, that the game is like that like Games should have space for like all different kinds of fun, even if that fun isn't something the game designer could conceive of. Um, yeah, which mm-hmm. is definitely like not an easy thing to do, you mm-hmm. know, when yeah, you're, you're saying like, I need to design for things I can't even imagine. Like, yeah, there's how? a reason why we've been um, working on Gazebos <laughs> for two plus years now. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, but I think in, you know, like in from my view too, like even the effort to go there says like okay, you've, you know, like, it's made me feel welcome, um, you know, that even, like, the, you know, we've we've tried and we understand that this is something that happens mm-hmm. is is certainly yeah. leaving mm-hmm. room for that. Yeah. Um, it's a big deal. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited to see uh, kind of what our options are in this game. Would we be able to walk through, like, a, like what would kind of happen at a session zero to, to kind of prep us getting into play for one of these chapters Uh, sure um how 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 deep do we want to go how how much on a scale of one of us explains it to we do it how on what's where do you want to land on that scale um well i mean the question at this point is for you like as far as time how much you know do you because like we're we're willing to do Mm -hmm. what like we yeah. are. I don't know. I'm in it now. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I would. I would. It'll be very. Me. It'll be very fast. So, uh, Lily, do we want to? Lily, do you want to have your first time entering Yuseva's bed and breakfast? As you, you stra- as you strap down the harness on this roller coaster, or, do you want to do this? <laughs> do we want to do this? Do we want to do this? Um, Last right. chance to back out. I'm good. And by right. that, I mean yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Hell yeah! All right. <laughs> Let's make some people. So the way it always, the way you always open a session of Yuseva's Bed and Breakfast is you read the first opening paragraphs which set the tone, which is, Once upon a time, the world was cruel, and there was a witch who knew it well. And so she sold her heart to build a house in the woods where the world could never find her. At first, she would let no one into her fortress, but in the long march of days, a strange thing happened. In her own cold and spiteful way, the witch made a friend, and then another, and then several more until her house was teeming with colorful faces and complicated lives. The house would come to be known as Yuseba's Bed and Breakfast, and it would last for a very long time. And then once you've kind of introduced, we've established, we've entered the ritual space, right? Mm -hmm. We Mm -hmm. look over the mysteries, which is on the front door of Yuseba's Bed and Breakfast, there is a sign which reads, No soliciting, trespassing, romancing, (laughs) snooping, snitching, or unnecessary small talk welcome. Yuseba reserves her temper for those that she catches violating these rules. Underneath that sign is a second smaller sign which reads, Room for Everyone. It is always September 15th inside the bed and breakfast, even if it's summer, spring, or winter outside. September 15th is Yuseba's favorite day of the year. Yuseba's bed and breakfast is in many places at many times, but is most frequently near the cozy village of Sleepy Town, somewhere on the East Coast sometime in the 20th century. Finally, every room is always next to every other room. The bed and breakfast is both quaint and sprawling. Um, Oh, I love it. And then the next step would be to introduce the residents, who we've talked about a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Lily, if you want to help me just introduce the, the six main residents besides Moonprints. Okay. Um, here, do you want the rules, Doc? I can 
Oh, yes, but I was yeah. gonna say, is this off yes, the dome? Yes, I was gonna say, I'm reading. Jay. I was gonna say, this is not <laughs> off the dome. I was Dear like God, horrified yeah. for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be scary if I could just do that. But I was I'm like, drop how many like, wow. podcasts have you been doing? <laughs> oh, I'm uh, I am very close to be. I'm dropping a bunch of links in the in the uh, in the Zoom chat. This is gotcha. just for us. So if we want to just, if anyone wants to just open these four pages really quick, just to. And in the first link I sent, uh, the rule sheet here, Lily, on page, if you go to where my cursor is on page three, do you want to introduce the residents? Heck yeah. All right. So there is Gertrude, a teenage girl who ran away from home and at the moment sleeps atop the dryer in the laundry room. She is kind and insecure, quiet and capable beyond expectations. Sal, a weary young adult who once studied to be Yuzeba's apprentice magic behind. Now he works as the night porter, but hopes to someday become a rock star, although it's not clear how he's going to get there. There's Hey Kid. Abandoned on the front door as a baby, they grew up amid the chaos of the bed and breakfast. Now they're a delightfully rambunctious devil child who causes disaster wherever they go. (laughs) Parish. Once a gallant knight, cursed by a wicked wizard to take the form of a frog. Now he's the bed and breakfast head and only cook, but he's still a courageous hero at heart. And then precious Amelie, dear Amelie, <laughs> Amelie. <laughs> a robotic maid acquired by the bed and breakfast. They are the meticulous housekeeper, constantly struggling and failing to keep the bed and breakfast tidy. They're still parsing oh. out how they're supposed to be. <laughs> and then there is Yezeba, uh, the owner of the bed and breakfast, a cold and heartless witch with no patience for mirth or uh, shikanari. 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 <laughs> I put on a fake accent when I can't figure out how to pronounce words. I love it. <laughs> it's great. That's a good. That's mm-hmm. a good move. Thank that you. Really Thank smart. you. Mm-hmm. It's like are we making a joke? Um, but mm-hmm. back to, <laughs> back to mm-hmm. um, some say that she secretly cares for her residents, but no one dares suggest it anywhere she might overhear them. So then, those are the. Oh yeah, yeah, just secret, this, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, secret of Moon Prince. Secret. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so those are the residents. Uh, we're gonna choose a chapter first, but once we choose a chapter, you'll be picking from the residents, and if none of them speak to you, you can look to the guests. Um, okay. So, if we want to click over just to get a sense, in I think it was the second link I sent. Mm-hmm. It's a big okay. spreadsheet called the chapter spreadsheet. Do folks see that? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very big uh, and dense. It's you know, it's all the chapters in the and game. Colorful. Yes, it's very, it's very visually overwhelming. So, um, <laughs> are there any, are there any like titles of chapters that you see just looking through that stand out to you that are interesting to you? Uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I was already interested in wash cycle because oh, yeah. that just sounded fun to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's do wash cycle. Um, okay. So we, we talked about it. Let's link. do it. Let's do it. Um, so it says with Gertrude, Sal, and anyone but Amelie. So someone should be Gertrude and someone should be Sal. Um, and then the other two okay. people can be whoever they want. So oh, fun. Does anyone, is anyone spoken to by Gertrude? Does anyone feel Sal? I would love to be Gertrude. <laughs> Wonderful. I think I'll be somebody else. Okay. Sounds good. Lily, do you want to be Sal or should I be Sal? I, I... Ooh, I really want to just be on the periphery and watch all this happen, if I can be quite honest. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. All right, okay, go cool. for it. <laughs> I, was, I mean, we're not going to play the game at all, so this is just prep. Oh, okay. We're just setting up, so it's it's a... It's yeah, a yeah. yeah, don't worry. Definitely not play. We have a strict no play. I was going to say, oh, yeah, no, no, okay. on this show. Yeah, we're not yeah. playing the game right now. We're just, we're just, we're doing everything up to the playing the game Oh, part. I yeah. feel you. Okay, I'll be Sal. I don't mind. Ryan, I sent you both the resident sheets and the guest list if you want to pick. Yeah. There's a lot of names. And so, and like the way it normally works in the game is that there's a few guests that start unlocked. And then as you play, you'll unlock more and some guests will leave also. So like there, you'll never have like be choosing from a list of 50 guests. But yeah. here we are and you can <laughs> choose from the list of 50 guests. So uh, there's one that has a description that starts a Neptunian octopus. Yes. Wait, yes. wait, wait, so wait, wait, wait. That's wait, Brim. Wait. Brim. So yes. that's you because I saw the word Neptunian. <laughs> Neptunian. I mean, I was thinking about that, but uh, I, I almost have to pick this other one. Um, mm-hmm. Ar- uh, how do you pronounce it? Arariel? Ooh, Angel the of the waters yeah. of the earth. 
Uh, Sounds yeah. fantastic mm. in a washing yeah. machine. <laughs> that does right. sound really yes, funny. The angel of the waters of the earth with so, a washing machine. So, Arariel, angel of the waters of the earth, a miasma of darkest blue light surrounded by six spinning wheels covered in eyes and 18 wings, wielding three flaming swords who only who uses only a name and no pronouns. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and a teenage runaway. And what was Sal? <laughs> Sal's an apprentice. That Sal's a former apprentice right. is now an aspiring Former rock star. apprentice. All right, mm-hmm. in a laundry room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just um, a slice I think, of life. I think, to, to, I think to, to finish it off, I think while we're all, I will be, um, I will be Rag and Bones, I think, since yes. we talked about him. Yes. Uh, a particularly oh, yes. unpleasant you. skeleton who uses he, him pronouns. Um, I don't know why, but I'm picturing like the, uh, oh gosh, what was that old cartoon, like Doodly Whiplash or the Snidely guy, Whiplash? The, Snidely Whiplash. With, oh, with yeah, the, yeah. Like, absolutely. <laughs> like a combination of that. It's like, old, absolutely just like, <laughs> only a skeleton. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, exactly. And for some reason, mm-hmm. the Groucho um, Marx mask or something. Oh my God. Yep. Yes. Um, and so now <laughs> we go over the rules. Uh, this is a frantic chapter, so it uses coin flipping as its main mechanic. You build mm-hmm. up. I'm not going to properly explain the rules because we're not going to play, but I'll kind of give yeah. the, the one page, you know, because this is a one page game, so like one page rule yeah. set. So it uses coin flipping. Um, you build up coins as you do things, and then you. Those coins make you more and more disastrous. They're chaos coins. Um, and we're basically just trying to complete this huge clock of like laundry, like the washing machine, the dryer, the you're trying to get everything through over time. Mm. Um, Sal, mm. you have a special header titled Very Busy Guy, Love which I'll me. read out loud. Um, Sal is very busy, of course, of course, and would rather be practicing for his concert tonight than sitting around folding laundry in the corner of the bed and breakfast. And whenever Sal doesn't want to do something, he's very good at making it everyone else's problem. Whenever Sal says something he thinks is encouraging or inspiring to another character, he can give away one of his chaos coins to them. So Sal can effectively encourage people and dump his coins onto them. And similarly, Gertrude... You have the header Yucky, which is Gertrude is brave, smart, hardy, and adventurous. She is also easily overwhelmed. Whenever an intense wave of smell penetrates her mask, an unidentified stain offends her eyes, or a slimy texture passes through her hands, tick off her grossed out track below. When the track fills up, Gertrude is too overwhelmed to function. She won't go take a break. Sal is depending on her, but she won't be able to do a good job until she recovers. So she can't cash in or give away chaos coins until someone helps her out and clears the track. Oh, me as a real person trying to yes. do the laundry in my house. Exactly. I, Great. Can, can I just say I love mm-hmm. a uh, the the me- mechanic for a washing machine uh, chapter is coins. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even realize yeah. that. That's incredible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, oh, mm-hmm. that's yep, so yep, good. Yep, yep, yep. That's so good. Um, and now finally, uh, yes, so we have learned that. the rules of the game. We have chosen characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, in mm-hmm. real life, we would simply be set to play. Uh, so uh-huh. I will lead us right up to the moment right before we start playing. Okay. Where on the first page of Chapter Ten Wash Cycle, there is this fiction prose, and mm-hmm. Gertrude and Sal, like we're in uh, high school and we're popcorn reading uh, some, you know, like some play. Can you read the the lines that are being spoken by your characters yeah. when they come up mm-hmm. as I read the fiction? So I'll be the narrator. Sure. And you can... Cool. Chapter Ten Wash Cycle with Gertrude, Sal, and anyone but Amelie in which the laundry room has become a disaster and Sal must lead the charge to fix it with Gertrude's reluctant help. (laughs) Amelie's arms had fallen off. This was less of a problem for Amelie than it would have been for most of the bed and breakfast residents, but the local (laughs) repair shop was waiting on a part from out of town to arrive and it had been an entire week since they'd twisted their joints apart mopping. Footprints mottled the floor, turning it the rich brown color of early spring mud. Gertrude was curled up with a book underneath the fax machine, trying not to eavesdrop too obviously on Sal's phone call. She didn't want to be in the lobby, but the smell of sweaty clothes and damp had filled the bed and breakfast, and the calming scent of printer ink clinging to the clunky device was the only thing that could crowd out the more pungent odors. Sal put down the phone with a heavy thud, and Gertrude looked over at him. What's wrong? Yezeba says... With Amelie at a commission, I've got to get all the laundry done. Today. Gertrude looked appalled. But, Sal, there's a mountain of clothes and sheets and stuff in there. What about your concert? I tried to bring that up, but she, uh, well. 
Sal glanced down at the phone's speaker, still glowing orange from heat, and scratched the back of his head. I don't think she liked the sound of that. Gertrude stood up, straightening out her back, which hurt a fair sight more than a teenager's probably should. Nobody knew how the laundry room better than her. She'd never been on laundry duty per se, but she'd tried to sleep through more than a few wash cycles. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, maybe you can still make your concert if someone else pitches in. Sal's eyes glinted. Really? That's so sweet of you, kid. Let's get to work. Before Gertrude could stammer out a clarification, the two of them were tumbling <laughs> headfirst into the laundry room. She looked out across the horror of the vast sea of dirty bedsheets and stinky socks and realized that she had just signed up for a very long day indeed. Oh, no. <laughs> and now we're ready to play. I have Gertrude, told you, you fool. That is, that is the process for playing, right? We just, mm. I didn't skip anything major. There was no, like, mm. there was yeah. nothing here that, like, we should have done that I didn't do. So, which means yeah. that for context, that took Super about... Super easy setup. Yeah, like, with all of our goofing and joking, which is getting cut from the recording, um, <laughs> right. that took well, us, like, fifth, <laughs> some of it, uh, that took about 15, 15, 20 minutes to do. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, and a lot of that was just, like, Ryan and I have never looked at this character list before. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, and, yeah. if we didn't have to have everything explained from... Nothing. I think mm -hmm. like you could do this in five. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And like <laughs> we're desperate. That, yeah, exactly. If you if you had people who already knew how you say this worked, you can easily like it's it's it was actually funny for the podcast recording because we budgeted a half hour before the recording to uh like set everything up. And because mm -hmm. for the podcast everyone already had their character and they already had the chapter, it was literally just I explained the rules to a one page game. And then we make small right. talk for like 20 <laughs> minutes, right? Like and it's like, very, it's very quick and comfortable. And like chapters yeah. get weirder, right? As you go on, there are late mm -hmm. chapters that are like 15 mm -hmm. pages long. There are like mm -hmm. bizarre corner cases and weird things. There's like a, there's a hex crawl inspired chapter that uses uh, like index cards to create an ocean. Uh, there's a chapter mm -hmm. that. Uh, it, it borrows from League of Legends lane combat, where it's like you've got three <laughs> lanes and you're trying to like <laughs> take control. Like, there's a lot of weird chapters, but yeah, <laughs> at the core but of it. But I like that that's an option because there are days where you're like, I want to like really like dig into it, and then there are days that you're like, I just want to like goof around and have like a exactly. back and forth kind mm -hmm. of you know mm -hmm. exactly yeah. And like again, that was it. That was that was that was the whole that was I the whole process. Yes. So that's a big part. That was another big part of why I've really fallen in love with pre-generated characters for this game is that yeah. I think oftentimes with one shots, you feel this kind of frustration where uh, you put all this work into building a character for a one shot and then mm -hmm. you never get to play the character again and you don't get an emotionally satisfying resolution. Right. And in mm -hmm. this game, you take, you pick up a, you choose a character, you pick them up, you embody them for a little bit. And then afterwards, once we're done with the chapter, you make a couple marks on the character sheet, like, indicating, like, if you've advanced the journey at all, if you've, like, made mm -hmm. any changes to the character, right? you can see your journey on there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you make these kind of marks, and then, like, you feel like your character has is part of a larger narrative, right? Because, like, your character is growing from your hands. So you pass on to other players, it'll, they'll, they'll continue to grow. Um, but also, like, your character feels, you know, like if, if, it feels like... I think it feels good if you're only going to play a game for an hour to be able to, you know, play mm -hmm. a chapter for an hour to be able to, like, know that th your character is not gone. Your character is not stuck in purgatory when you <laughs> end the game. They, yeah. Like, they'll, yeah. They'll, 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 someone else is going to pick up, right? Like, right? like, if you made choices about Arariel and you, like, made notes on the sheet and you, like, you know, checked off boxes on the journey, the next person who picks up Arariel would have access to all that information and could, that would change how they play it. And, like... Certainly, mm -hmm. my RRL is going to be different from yours, mm -hmm. but we can both learn from that angel, you know? Absolutely. Um, can we, like, peel back the curtain a little bit and, and like, talk about some of the stuff that are on these character sheets? Since, sure. since it was yeah. Super yeah, like, swift. what kind of things are you marking off? Because mm -hmm. I'm very interested in this idea of, like, playing in a character that's, like, already a little bit lived in. Mm -hmm. Because even when I do a campaign, it's still my decisions 
that are mm-hmm. impacting things, not yeah. somebody else's. And I know yeah. I personally have like a little bit of weirdness about like giving over like my thing, like this is mine. I think maybe <laughs> that is certainly the appeal of, of folks. I mean, and there's mm-hmm. a difference with like pre-generated ones, obviously. Yeah, yeah. If it comes with characters, like this isn't my my baby mm-hmm. that I'm handing off to yeah. people. But And I think there is, there are, you know, there are some people where it's like, I mentioned the playtester who just wants to play Parish, right? And every session mm-hmm. they play Parish and they're the one, like... I would feel kind of weird for my real life playtest if someone else played Parish because they've kind of really, you know, connected with Parish yeah. for that iteration of Yasebas. Um mm-hmm. but so like, you know, you can kind of grow a very strong attachment and invest in a character, but also I like to think of it a lot as I think tying back to the larger trend of games about where you're telling stories instead of playing characters, right? Like I'm sorry, did you mm-hmm. say Street Magic or the Quiet Year? This is a game where people get where like characters get to um, like they're like the character's journey itself is collaborative, right? Like we're all working together to tell that kind mm-hmm. of story. Absolutely. I don't know, Lily. Do, do Lily? Do you have more mm-hmm. thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> the the thoughts that I have honestly are geared towards just like how each character changes. It sounds strange to say, mm-hmm. I guess how each character changes in its own right versus like passing them off to other people to play them. Yeah. Um, like mm-hmm. Gertrude's whole uh, journey. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> it sounds kind of like difficult to explain, <laughs> but I suppose like towards the later chapters, that version of Gertrude versus the beginning version of Gertrude just seems so different mm-hmm. before anyone ever even plays her. Mm-hmm. One of the One of the tricks we did is that um, your character, residents, everyone's got a journey. Residents have more uh, complex journeys, but a journey is effectively like marking your character's arc as it goes from player to player. So like Gertrude, for example, starts with a journey that says like, you don't feel at home, check off these things when they happen. And they're all about making connections. And once she completes that, she goes into a phase where she's trying to figure out if she wants to be more of a witch's apprentice or if she wants to just have fun and be herself. And so she's Mm -hmm. kind of pushing those against each other. And so that's kind of a character arc that emerges over time. And then, as Lily said, as the chapters go on, later chapters represent this more mature version of Gertrude, a Gertrude who can stand up to Yazeba, a Gertrude who can Mm -hmm. assert herself, who can do magic. Um, And so the character kind of is kind of given space to grow in these ways, but also because, you know, you can take notes on the character sheet, you can change, you can make you can make your own markings and stuff. The character grows in your own way and almost like builds up this kind of accumulation of mm-hmm. your inputs, other people's inputs, the game's inputs, right? All these things kind of come yeah. together um, that allows, you know, like certainly, you know, if you come into, you know, like you can come into a game and play Gertrude and like you're going to play Gertrude different than other people. There's also, you know, like there's no shared coherent chronology you know I mean, you're not gonna get in trouble for playing gertrude yeah. differently mm-hmm. yeah there's no gertrude metaplot exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome mm-hmm. i'm really intrigued by like how you i don't want to say balance because that has like that's such a you know like kind of a loaded word in mm-hmm. rpgs um but how you kind of like weigh that um the game has like those you know paragraphs at the beginning of chapters is like a little bit of narrative and then you know, also the decisions that the players are making over the course of the chapters. Like, how do you balance those two things? Like, the decisions that players are making versus the sort of fiction that you have already built into the game? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, the answer could be, like, I don't know. I I, I, I actually, Lily, I feel like this ties into when when you were first starting out, I remember sort of working with you a bit on, like, when does the fiction stop? Yeah, like, mm-hmm. how, like it's and it's a really weird thing to write these chapters because you you're writing a story up until the plot starts, right? Like you're mm-hmm. writing. Like, it's really hard. It's you, really hard. Like I know even in world building stuff that I've done that it's like, where do you stop and say, okay, now we have to like play to find out. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. where do you stop writing the thing? Yeah, I can only speak for myself, but I found myself naturally stopping on the ellipses and on the cliffhanger. Uh, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I <laughs> I kind of went at it how I try to motivate myself to continuing projects. So if I yeah. literally so like if I'm like drawing something on Tuesday night and I think I have to work on this on Wednesday, I can't stop when it's like the most boring part. I have to stop when it's fun so that I can pick it up when it's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's a great way to put it. And like a lot of these chapters, like 
the ideal is that like they stop and they make you go, oh, well, what happens next? Like, we don't want to stop on a on a satisfying conclusion. We mm-hmm. want to stop on a spot where you're like, oh, what's well, what's the next bet? Well, you mm-hmm. tell me. Yeah. There's actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's actually there's an interesting concept in in running games for kids that I think about a lot, which is a, t- a tactic when you're running games for kids is you want to end the game when the kids are having fun. You don't mm-hmm. if you're running, you know, if you're running games, with kids, you don't want to stop when the kids are getting bored. You want to stop mm-hmm. when the kids are having fun. And that's part of the trick because Ava's trap is being short is they kind of make you want to see well, what's the next step for people. But also, I think it's just sort of an important like process within the story. And like, you know, Lily and I have both worked, you know, with kids at various points. And so I think there's a lot of that. Uh, and certainly the rest of the team, too, I'm thinking about. It. I'm like, oh, my God, everyone on this project has done early child education. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like part of that is like g- having the game feel like it's it's giving you the first step and then hinting at what the second step is mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. asking you for the third step. You know, like it's the kind of like, yeah, I do. You, I do. We do. You do teaching process where it's like, yeah, the concierge reads the fiction. Y- we are doing the voices of the fiction and then you know then we start playing back and forth exactly mm-hmm. yeah. it's, it's mm-hmm. very much like yeah. the guardian teaching their child to um bike and like does not tell exactly. the kid yeah it's like i'm not going to tell you yeah. i'm taking my hands off your back and you're going to look back and i'm not even behind you anymore mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah the best the best chapter intros are the ones where uh play like rock on is a, a good example of this actually because rock on uh the way the chapter goes is Sal and Gertrude driving in a car together and like getting out at the at the house in, in suburbia in Sleepy Town Suburbia where the where the rock party is. And they're going into the concert and the the chapter open the chapter the chapter fiction ends as they go through the door and they're at the party. <laughs> and it's this very kind of like, like it makes you immediately want to say what Gertrude does. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Cause like mm-hmm. Gertrude is quiet. She's nervous. What does she do? And it like pushes you immediately into that. Um, mm-hmm. And you're like, I want to know, I want to tell you what Gertrude does. Like, I know, you know, like, yeah. you've got a sense <laughs> of what Gertrude would do here. Yeah. But also a lot of that yeah. goes into what you were saying too, Jay, which is like, I can't explicitly say Gertrude sees somebody hanging from the rafters screaming into a mic if that's not the kind of music that you anticipated you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it has to go with what the people are um, already imagining themselves Mm -hmm. and what kind of venue they're Mm -hmm. imagining for themselves we we have advice in the book for when you have to rewrite a little bit of the chapter fiction to accommodate something that's maybe changed in your own personal game Um, but Mm -hmm. also we do play a number of little tricks like Gertrude, for example, starts by sleeping on the dryer in the laundry room. That's where she begins. It's a very, like, fragile, unloved place because she feels like she doesn't belong in the house. Uh, That is a thing which you as a player want to fix almost immediately, right? Like, you want to get her a room as soon as possible. Get you a bed! (laughs) Yeah, and, like, like you have that impulse. Um, And so in the fiction, we never explicitly say where Gertrude is sleeping, we always leave it a little ambiguous as to whether or not she's in a... Like, even in this fiction, it was very careful, right? Gertrude has a lot of experience with the laundry room. She knows it better than anyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But don't, we don't say that that's where she sleeps. Um, and mm-hmm. the reason right. for that is because we know players are going to want to change that. And so we mm-hmm. leave a little bit of the fiction. Like, we take a step back and let players do that. And then it turns out that the book has been ready for them to do that this whole time. Right, because mm-hmm. like a Gertrude, a Gertrude who is staying in the laundry room and says she knows it better than anyone is different than a Gertrude who used to stay in the laundry room and knows it better than and anyone. It right, it's a different, anyone. it's a, it's yeah. a different mm-hmm. feeling, and so the game catches you yeah. no matter which way you want to go with that. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's so good. So good. Oh, that's so <laughs> okay. cool. That's so cool. Now I want to like it. Now I want to throw my kids into this game though and see mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what they see what do happens. though, because they always that's I one thing that I love about playing with my kids is that like. They they also don't know those limits of what an RPG should be. Mm-hmm, so you like mm-hmm. throw them into things and they're like, let me describe this whole buffet <laughs> set up for you. And, and you're like, like, I did yes. not say there was a buffet, but great. Mm-hmm, go for mm-hmm, it. Love mm-hmm. it. Also, <laughs> not not to be um, menacing, <laughs> but I feel like what a great plan. Also, if your kids are like being incredibly rowdy, that you're like, hey, you want to play as Cricknick? You want to play as? <laughs> <laughs> what are your rabbits in the garden? I Literally. feel like... Um, 
kids why don't you be a quiet pumpkin (laughs) kids kids have incredible creative energy kids are so much more daring like i love role-playing with kids i much prefer to role-playing with adults because kids kids have kind of an endless creative capacity and a lack of shame and a lack of need for the yes and nobody has said to them like you you can't do that yeah nobody has gone out like nobody on reddit has told them that that's not a game exactly and so kids, <laughs> kids are very liberated and the downside right and so the the downside that kids deal with is that um kids are still learning how to play with other people and so yeah. the tension point for kids comes from where their ideas intersect and the trick for designing a game that's easy for both kids and grown-ups to get into is that for with kids you want a game that helps them modulate their different imaginations. Whereas for grownups, mm. you want a game which prompts them forward with their imaginations mm. and encourages them to share and and move into space with each other. And like, and yeah. also giving space to each other. Like, you know, basically you're you're you want to have a game that can kind of do both. And the mm-hmm. the magic trick of Yazebas is one of the one of the many magic tricks of Yazebas yeah. is trying to find that space where it 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 enables kids to balance themselves with each other and it enables grown-ups to share and reaccess that childlike part of play. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I've found that there's there are not that many games that do that. There are there are like lots of games out there that are like this is for kids and then there are games that are like this is for adults and there are very few that are like okay, we can all do this together. I, like let's I, do a yeah. family game. I find there's not that, yeah. that many. I find games Tabletop role playing games written for kids, with a couple of exceptions. Kevin Kevin Parker is a great guy, um, but overwhelmingly, I find them frustrating because I think that they are oftentimes much more about what grown ups believe kids want to be playing rather yeah. than what kids enjoy playing. And like the yes. thing that I've I've certainly learned is that uh, grown ups are much uh, more squeamish and more sentimental than kids are, um, yeah. and so it's like. You know, there are there are a lot of things which uh, to a kid is funny and to a grown up is monstrous. And that's OK. That's fine. Right. Like a right. kid finds children love, I think, a lot of violent games because they don't understand, you know, that they don't they don't conceptualize that right. as they have a relationship with the actual violence. And so to them, it's this, right. like, right. you know, you've got, you know, pinata people. Um, right. Yeah. Which is, exactly. is, is fine, you know, but it, it, I think it shows mm-hmm. right that like designing a game for kids. There's the question of is this a game that kids play on their own? Is this a kid a game that kids play with grownups? Like a grownup is fatil- facilitating. Like what is the context of play? And the thing that yeah. I like to joke about is that I like to joke that Possum Creek games are for um, kids who are too old, who, who kids who are uh, reading above their grade level, right? Like, I want to, <laughs> I want to write games for the kid in Barnes and Noble who's sitting on the floor opening up Vampire the Masquerade books, like with you know the the kid who the kid who's maybe getting in a little over their head, but like that's part of being a kid, and like that's right. kind of the the trick of of a lot of Possum Creek game materials is like, yeah, these are games for kids who are just starting to be ready to like learn like learn the intricacies of the world and like also the games that are good for kids to play with other kids without even a grown up mm-hmm. present right like kind of yeah. how do you make space for that is its own trick yeah which i think is why i'm looking at this one and saying like oh yeah mm-hmm. like my son oh, yeah. would play oh, yeah, this cuz sure. he's one of those like oh where's that mm-hmm. book that i wanted to check out from the library mm-hmm. and I'm like that's mm-hmm. over in the adult section and mm-hmm. not with the picture books so you need exactly to like- <laughs> exactly and like i was yeah. like and i i my first exposure to tip role playing games was uh hiding in the corner of Barnes and Noble reading fourth edition monster manuals um yeah mm. and the rule with my dad my dad's rule with me was if i could read the book at Barnes and Noble, I wasn't allowed to bring it home. So I would sit in Barnes and Noble for like <laughs> six hours and read like six books. And then I would have three more that I was like, Dad, we gotta buy these. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Game the system. Mm-hmm. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, so our last question here. Is there anything else that you want people to know um, in particular about the crowdfunding campaign or anything like that? Um, I know we've we've run through a lot of the like really system stuff and the game stuff, but you know, the more the more real world <laughs> facts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Lily, what's the part you're most excited for? Uh, March 22nd, 2022. Uh, <laughs> no, genuinely, I'm, I'm just excited <laughs> the, 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 for the launch. 
Yeah. Um, but like genuinely, I'm excited for the launch. I checked the backer kit. Um, what is it? The the clock, like the countdown. Oh, um, yep. Oh, I know. It officially says like one day. It's, something. It's, yeah, we are. We are. We are recording. It is cur- at the time that we are currently recording. It is one day and. Uh, 18 hours away. Yeah. Uh, not, not that you I have the clock from, up. <laughs> nope, I did that from my mind. I did that straight <laughs> oh, from my mind. <laughs> I, 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 I already put in my paid time off at my day job. I'm like, I'm not working that day. Are you kidding me? I'm going <laughs> to... You cannot. <laughs> I, I, I have a website imagine. to refresh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but beyond um, the actual mm-hmm. day, I am very excited for all of the, the little merch and goodies that are going to come from it as well. Um, mm. And also mm-hmm. the... um Well... Let me not flub the the name of it. Uh, da, 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 da. Multiverse. Question Multiverse. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Love mm-hmm. that. Very excited for the we, digital play. We're partnering. We're partnering with a virtual tabletop uh st- company. Like if you're familiar with Roll Twenty, this is kind of yeah, yeah. Like yeah, mm-hmm. if Roll Twenty met Stardew Valley effectively in terms of mm-hmm. like what it's like to play. It's it's a Genuinely, yeah. I want you. Okay, I want you to understand. I am a huge stickler when it comes to virtual tabletops. Like my preferred way of playing is like a Discord call and Excel spreadsheet. Um, mm-hmm. But this, they charmed me. They really did. We we played a <laughs> we played a session of Yazebas on Multiverse, and uh, it was genuinely a experience that I've not had in any other game environment like it is it's a way of playing because you're playing these characters and you're like you're running around a fully realized bed and breakfast like the the there's gonna be a level that's the bed like there's multiple levels that are the bed and breakfast and so you run around and you like if you're bored of the conversation or you want to like just explore you can just go and like find objects and like there's gonna be like mouse over text for them so like you can like like you could effectively solo explore these levels just for fun (gasps) Um, it's just, and like it's such a different way of playing, but it's so much fun mm-hmm. and it's so intuitive. And I LARPed for about ten years before I started playing mm-hmm. tabletop games, and it is so much like it has all the best qualities of you get to run around and the objects you pick up matter, and you get to like explore the world and feel like your actions are oh, tangible amazing. and physical. It's really. Uh, it's really a cool thing. I'm really excited for the multiverse stuff. It's going to be like, it's genuinely like, it is hard to explain because it's just so different from what we normally see for digital yeah. stuff. Yeah. But with a game with stickers and stuff for the physical component, we had to do something special for the digital, you know? Um, yeah, I know that's a thing that I, I mean, I've been seeing more and more games that have a digital component to them. And mm-hmm. I think especially given like state of the world as it is right now, exactly. um, more and more games are having to think about that. Mm-hmm. Of, like, how do we play when we can't be together? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, one, one really cool thing also is so there are some guests whose mechanics and journey involve tactile components. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, Alex Dulahan, who is a headless uh, biker horsewoman. Like a like a, like the headless horseman, but on a motorcycle, and she's a yeah. lesbian. Um, yeah, uh, like you do, as you do. Um, her um, uh, what do you call it? her journey in paper? Is you draw tattoos on her arm to like as you like play chapters with her, she gets new tattoos. When her arm is filled up, she has to go back hmm. biking, and then she can come back with a new tattoo arm. But that's not an easy thing to do online. So we're going to be working with yeah. the multiverse folks to figure out what is a like a completely different journey that's digital friendly that will be like cool. it, it, utilizing online mechanics like you know like things like things like you know like being able to you know like randomize stuff or like change stuff based on time of day or like you know being mm. able to like simulate things like all the sorts of things that like things that being online let you do that you can't do on tabletop we're going to use as ways to even though the game will be different online and in person We'll be enhancing mm-hmm. it. You know, we're like, it's still a full, you still get a exactly. full experience. Yeah. And like the thing that's, that we, I, we've really talked awesome. about, the thing we've talked about a lot is that we're not trying, like, we don't want to be simulating a tabletop online. We're making a new experience that lines up with the physical. So it's like yeah. a different. That's really cool. That makes like me that. really happy. Cause like as someone who I, I don't have local friends um, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. play tabletop games. The majority mm-hmm. of my friends are long distance. And like even mm-hmm. Ryan and I have actually never played at a table together. Mm-hmm. Nope. Um, <laughs> and so like it's, there are lots of games that are like, well, you can kind of do mm-hmm. it over here online. And it's like, but I want the full experience, even if it's not the same experience as you would get in person. I still want a full 
mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so it's yeah. like, I'm okay with things being different. Like there are mm-hmm. some things you can't simulate, but then mm-hmm. make sure that what I'm doing over here makes up for that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and so I'm really glad that you're thinking, thinking that part through. Cause yeah. that, that is awesome for people like me uh-huh. who would love to have local friends, but just don't. <laughs> it's also so funny. Um, the multiverse team, the other big project they're working on right now is Blades in the Dark. So oh, yeah. they're making their Blades in the Dark thing and they're making their Yusebas thing. And there are no two tone, more tonally distant games. <laughs> they're really different. Blades in the Dark music. Um, yeah. So. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, that's really exciting because I, I, like I said, I don't get to engage with that kind of stuff very often Mm -hmm. um and to hear that you're excited about it too um especially as someone who's like Mm -hmm. not you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would not play virtually all the time yeah Yeah. it's giving me a um what was it a a maniac mansion vibe if we were able to role play in the maniac mansion uh from the olden days haven't you ever wished you could invite all your friends into stardew valley and then all pretend to be characters in stardew valley right uh, Together, and like run yeah. around start, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. That, that sounds amazing mm-hmm. like honestly yes i would play that in a minute yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely um so and then the other the other thing i want to point out too is that you're not doing this through kickstarter it looks like right we are you're not doing we're it through... doing it through indiegogo indiegogo mm-hmm. okay yes we we decided to do indiegogo after uh kickstarter's announcement in december about nfts uh, mm-hmm. Indiegogo also offered us a lot more press support and like we went to them and we were basically like here's how much of our audience we are worried we will lose if we leave Kickstarter and they were like here's how we can support you to make up for that so awesome. and, like, they've been great Indiegogo is going to be a really cool new experience for us uh, it is you know this is our first time not using Kickstarter for a big project like this but I'm excited yeah. to see how it goes um, yeah. it's mm-hmm been a really i've been i've spent the past two weeks setting up the indiegogo page and it is a actually a very surprisingly flexible and effective system that does a bunch of things that i wish kickstarter did (laughs) yeah no i know i've seen a lot of creators kind of saying that like okay i have to figure out what to do to switch from kickstarter and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. but i also know that like for me i've just sort of been like trained to go to kickstarter to look for the things Mm -hmm. so i did just want to point out that like that's not where it is (laughs) there will be a link in the description though so click on that absolutely we will Mm -hmm. and we will tweet about it a bunch because i'm excited about it so absolutely Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um well Jay and Lily, thank you both so much for sitting down to talk with us about Yuzeba's bed and breakfast. This was so much fun. Oh, this was, fun. What a good discussion. Thank no you. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you want to remind everyone where they can find you online? Yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and HIO uh, under Lily, the letter J. So Lily J. Harris. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at uh, at J uh, letter J drag ski. Um, I am the most notable J dragon on Twitter. So certainly if you search for J dragon, I'm sure you can find me. Um, and you can also, uh, all my stuff is associated with Possum Creek games. So check out Possum Creek games.com, Possum Creek games.itch.io. Uh, you can find a lot of stuff there. Very cool. Uh, well, again, thank you both so much for joining us and for the special bonus episode of character creation spotlight. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, do not forget to check out uh, Ya Zebaz <laughs> uh, Bed and Breakfast <laughs> a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, what should be going on right now? Ooh, amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I am either very proud of how it's going or filled with dread at every moment. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, A little bit of both. <laughs> a little yep. bit of both. You'll, you will know when this episode launches. Right. You'll, you'll yes, when you go look it up, you'll yeah. know. <laughs> you'll know how I yep. feel. <laughs> I'm sure you are very excited for how it's going. I, I sure. sure I sure hope I sure hope the the J Dragon who's hearing this is otherwise one hundred percent positive absolutely all right we will see you next time everyone. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at LordNeptune.com. 
or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Warda. Warda is an original fantasy actual play podcast created by Ali Grauer and Drew Marzieski. It's one part Game of Thrones two parts Downton Abbey, served on the rocks with a twist of Agatha Christie. Discover magic, mystery, and more than a little sociopolitical commentary along the way. The city holds thousands of stories. What will yours be? Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. There we go. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Close enough. Close the waveforms. All right. I will do a five count for background noise, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Is that good? Right. Well, I'm going to take a sip of my coffee first, and then I'm going to do that. <laughs> Priorities. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Computers you really wanna... slow, but I'm copying. No <laughs> worries. I just bombarded us with Google Docs. <laughs> so I was like, oh, sh- oh heck. I oh, heck. Have... <laughs> oh, heck. Oh, darn. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> Gosh it. darn it, as Ryan would mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. Oh, goodness gracious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, as you and no one else at an adult age says. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, my poor computer. It's it's We are all, trying to oh, teach no, my so son uh, okay. different words of uh of exclaiming uh uh I don't know, goodness gracious <laughs> quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh You're trying to you teach know, your child to n- to say things not swear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So goodness gracious, good gosh. Oh <laughs> golly. Uh all that sort of fun stuff. Uh Instead of, you know, harsher words that some kids will be using. Um, oh, yeah. See, and my son, like, corrects mine because I will swear. And then he's like, oh, mom word. <laughs> and I was like, great. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so now we can stop our oh, nice. recordings and...